In the previous video, we discussed the oblique muscles. We started off with the external oblique, and then if you remove those, we have the deeper internal oblique muscles, which are shown here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the left internal oblique muscle here to expose the underlying or deep transverse abdominus muscle. So from superficial to deep, at least in the anterolateral core, we have external oblique, internal oblique, and then we have the underlying transversus abdominus muscle. Now, when we talked about the external oblique, uh, remember that the fibers, as you went medially, uh, the fibers actually had a little bit of a downward orientation. With the internal oblique, as we go medially, the fibers seem to have kind of an upward orientation. And that's actually partly why they're called obliques, because they actually move at an oblique angle. But then notice with the transversus abdominis, it actually kind of gives it away in the name, transverse or horizontal. The fibers are all running horizontally. So in the center here, it's a little bit of a, dark, a lighter green color, but this is supposed to be the aponeurosis right here of the transversus abdominis. Right here is the arcuate line. So remember, above the arcuate line, we have both an anterior and posterior rectus sheath. This would actually be the posterior rectus sheath. The anterior would be in front of the rectus abdominis, so that's obviously not visible here. And then below the arcuate line, we would actually have just a rectus sheath, which lies anterior to the rectus abdominis muscle. And then off to the side laterally over here, this is the muscle belly of transversus abdominis. So let's get into that. We're now kind of looking at sort of a side view of this. Right here, you can't see it, but this would be where the linea alba is. And then coming off of that, we of course have the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle. Okay? And then over here is the muscle belly of the transversus abdominis muscle. So this is in the lateral abdominal wall, deep to the oblique muscles, and it is the deepest core muscle of any of them. If we look at the origins of this muscle, it originates from ribs 7 through 12, specifically the internal surfaces of the costal cartilages. You can actually see some of that origin right here. It also originates off of the thoracolumbar fascia, and that's going to be extremely important when we start talking about the clinical importance of this muscle. Um, all of these muscles are important, but I would actually argue that clinically speaking, the core muscle that most people are going to need uh, understanding how to contract and strengthen is this one, the transversus abdominis, which is often abbreviated TRA. It also has origins off of the iliac crest, specifically the anterior two-thirds of it, uh, and then also on the iliopectineal arch. Okay? And this muscle is going to insert on the linea alba via this broad aponeurosis. Um, also, it's going to fuse with the aponeurosis of the internal oblique muscle, uh, and then it also inserts on the pubic crest down here and the pectineal line of the pubis. Now for the actions of transversus abdominis, regardless of whether it's contracting bilaterally or unilaterally, it's going to tense on the linea alba during abdominal contraction. Now, knocking out the unilateral function first, it's going to facilitate ipsilateral trunk rotation. We don't normally think about it doing this, but it can. So if we wanted to facilitate left trunk rotation, we would need the action of the left transversus abdominis, and more so of the left internal oblique and the right external oblique. Remember, the external oblique facilitates contralateral trunk rotation. And now for the bilateral contraction. This is what's important clinically. So, number one, this muscle, when contracted bilaterally, compresses the abdominal viscera during forced expiration and intense effort, like exercise, just like any of the core muscles do. And it also braces the spine and the abdominal contents during intense effort, especially with things like lifting. So if you have somebody who is lifting a heavy box from the floor, and especially if they're using poor mechanics, and especially if their core is weak, it makes it likely that they will not only hurt their back, but also develop a hernia. So this muscle especially really braces the abdominal viscera because it's closest to the viscera. It's the deepest muscle. And it has the best capacity to do that because its fibers run horizontally. Structure dictates function. If you ever have somebody who wears a lifting belt around their core, what orientation do the fibers of the lifting belt, or the back brace, what are you going to call it, what orientation do they have? 
Well, they run around horizontally. They are horizontal fibers, so to speak. I mean, they're synthetic, but they're horizontal fibers. This transversus abdominis muscle, this is your natural back brace. This is your natural corset, sometimes called the corset muscle. So if you want to be able to lift a lot of weight without back pain and without risking a herniation, like an umbilical hernia or an inguinal hernia, this muscle has got to be strong. And it often gets weak simply by disuse, but also after lumbar surgeries. So after lumbar surgeries and you're rehabbing someone with that, it's very important that, especially very early on, you address strengthening. So I've had patients in the clinic when I was first starting out as a physical therapist that came in with low back pain and associated radiating sciatic symptoms down one of their legs. And I would throw at them, you know, the typical exercises, and they worked with some people, like piriformis stretches, sciatic nerve glides, you know, massage of the low back muscles, get the tightness out, long axis distractions, you know, therax and manual therapy. However, some patients do not respond well to that. And I learned pretty quickly that some patients will actually respond very well to strengthening this muscle because it's weak and it makes them better able to tolerate the other exercises once they have a little bit of stabilization from the transversus abdominis. Uh, you can see here it braces the spine and the abdominal contents during intense effort, deadlifting, squats, overhead presses. If you're an athlete, this muscle better be strong. And there's other ways that you can strengthen it, which we'll talk about in later videos. And like the other muscles of the core, uh, this one gets segmental innervation. So the motor innervation is via the intercostal nerves and the subcostal nerve. And it also gets sensory innervation from the iliohypogastric nerve and the ilioinguinal nerve. And then the blood supply is via the lower posterior intercostal and subcostal arteries, the superior and inferior epigastric arteries, the superficial and deep circumflex arteries, and the posterior lumbar arteries. Now coming back to the actions of the transverses abdominis, we mentioned of course that it helps to brace the spine during intense effort, but it also helps to keep the vertebral canal open during that intense effort. So making sure that the vertebral canal doesn't essentially collapse inward or structures like the ligamentum flavum impinge on the spinal cord or if you go further down the cauda equina. So how does that work? Well right here we have a cross section of the lumbar spine. So here's the vertebral body right here. Um, here's the psoas major and here you've got the erector spiny muscles. And then right here is a bundle of muscles. Multifidus is probably in here somewhere as well. Uh, right here behind the vertebral body, you actually see uh, the canal for uh, the spinal cord. And if we went down far enough, it would be the cauda equina. Okay? And this is a pretty small space. We want to make sure that it doesn't get compressed or impinged, especially if you're Ronnie Coleman over here deadlifting some 800 pounds or something like that. So look over here at the lateral core wall. So superficially, we have the external oblique. We really don't care about that. In the middle, we have the internal oblique. Don't really care about that so much, although it does play a little bit of a role here. But notice here, you've got the transversus abdominis muscle, okay? If we follow the transversus abdominis from the front of its muscle belly all the way back, we see that it actually blends with the thoracolumbar fascia. This little white tissue right here, this is the thoracolumbar fascia. Remember, that's part of the origin of the transversus abdominis. As you follow the thoracolumbar fascia, right where my mouse is, that's an important structure called the lateral raphe. The lateral raphe is an important structure here, and it represents a division of the thoracolumbar fascia. So real quick, this muscle right here, this is the quadratus lumborum muscle. So if we look at the lateral raphe, it gives off a pretty large branch that goes anterior to the quadratus lumborum, and this would actually be the anterior thoracolumbar fascia. From the lateral raphe, another piece of it goes behind the quadratus lumborum, and then it again divides into a middle thoracolumbar fascia, which actually goes out to the transverse process in part of the vertebrae, and then it also gives off a posterior thoracolumbar fascia, which you can follow all the way behind these muscles, behind the erector spiny, all the way to the midline, and that's where we're going to kind of leave it there. Now this is a situation 
where it's kind of like the foot bone's connected to the ankle bone, which is connected to the shin bone, which is connected to the knee, and so on and so forth. So if we take one structure and pull on it, it's going to take all the structures that are attached to that and pull on those. Okay, So the transversus abdominis muscle and technically some of the internal oblique, they're actually going to attach on this thoracolumbar fascia. The thoracolumbar fascia, if we go through the lateral raphe and the various divisions, particularly this posterior division, we go all the way back here, it's going to attach on the supraspinous ligaments. Remember, the supraspinous ligaments are ligaments that connect the various spinous processes, right? And then the supraspinous ligaments are also attached to the interspinous ligaments, which you can't see here. And then in turn, the interspinous ligaments are attached to the ligamentum flavum. Now recall that the ligamentum flavum actually exists within the vertebral canal. If you were deadlifting 800 pounds like this, or however much is an extremely high load to you as an individual, well, there's a good possibility that the spinal column, or really the vertebral canal, is going to lose a little bit. It's not going to close, but it's going to lose a little bit of its cross-sectional area. And the ligamentum flavum could actually move further into that vertebral canal and impinge on the nervous structures that are in there. We don't want that. So what happens is, is the transversus abdominis contracts during a lift like this, or any kind of functional movement that might require a heavy load, and it pulls on the thoracolumbar fascia, which pulls on the lateral raphe, which pulls on the various divisions of the thoracolumbar fascia, which then pulls on the supraspinous ligaments, which then pulls on the interspinous ligaments, which pulls on the ligamentum flavum, and that helps to prevent that ligamentum flavum from collapsing into the vertebral canal. Helps to keep that vertebral canal as open as possible. Additionally, the multifidus, which is likely in here somewhere, is also going to tense on the thoracolumbar fascia and pull it posteriorly. All in all, we're just trying to maintain spinal alignment and prevent collapse into the vertebral canal. This system right here, where the transversus abdominis indirectly attaches on the ligamentum flavum, this is called the IST complex. The I is for interspinous, the S is for supraspinous, and depending on how you want to talk about it, the T is for thoracolumbar fascia, or transversus abdominis, so IST complex. And so overall, during this loading of the spine, the IST complex and multifidus indirectly place tension on the ligamentum flavum and prevent its collapse into the vertebral canal, thereby preserving the cross-sectional area of the vertebral canal under large loads. So hopefully that makes sense, and that concludes our discussion on the function and structure of the transversus abdominis. In the next video, I'm gonna show you how to activate that muscle. And knowing how to activate it is important to be able to strengthen it. And so with any patient, you're gonna to want to first show them how to palpate it, then show how to activate it, and then you can strengthen it. Make sure to join us then. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.